The Atlanta Braves are back on the field, and we are back again for another edition of BPTV. Grant McCauley and Chris Willis with you as always. Before we get started, let me remind you, go ahead and leave a like on this video and hit that subscribe button to the BPTV channel, the Battery Power channel here on YouTube. Turn on those notifications. You'll get an alert every time we drop a new episode, and goodness knows we've been busy and we got a lot of episodes to go, not just in spring training, but over the course of what the Braves hope will be a very, very intriguing 2024 season. So, Chris, uh, I say all that to say the Braves are back in action. A few notable debuts thus far this spring and a few stories to get into today. Yeah, it's been fun getting uh, getting started out and trying to get back into the routine of having baseball every single day. Uh, but yeah, like, as you mentioned, uh, some pretty notable debuts and uh, you know, happy to talk, be talking about it with you today. Absolutely. Happy to see the Braves back on TV a time or two here early. A few more broadcasts will be coming our way a little bit later on, but you know, it just feels like a new year when you finally got your team back on your television as well. Uh, first look at this team and the rest of baseball here over the first few uh, you know, days, games, weeks, if you will, of Grapefruit League and Cactus League play for that matter. But in the Grapefruit League, they're getting a good look at Spencer Strider's new pitch. A first look at that. It appears that he spent the winter working on a new wrinkle in his breaking ball offerings, the slider. We already know that's an elite pitch, as is his fastball. When I talked to him about the secondaries, though, he said he's not trying to veer away from what works so well as a fastball slider pitcher. But as we know, adding to the mix gives right-handed hitters or hitters in general something to contend with. And righties, they batted 208 against Strider last year. Lefties, they clocked in at 211. So it's not like anybody was enjoying their time in the box against Strider. I did find this a little bit interesting, though. 44, Chris, of his 58 walks were issued to lefties. So if you're wondering, that split was 25 walks to righties and only 20 to lefties the year before. I don't know what all that means, but I think that some of the thinking, at least part of it has to be having an extra swing and miss pitch to deal with lefty hitters. And coincidence or not, when I snapped that video of, the, of Spencer Strider in his first live BP, it was Matt Olson who he unleashed it against. So uh, what do you make of the breaking ball, the curve ball, as it were, and what it can mean to Spencer Strider this year? I think it's a, a welcome addition to his arsenal. Uh, you know, we know Strider is a guy that's not just going to sit on his laurels. You know, he's got a dominant fastball, dominant slider. We saw the change up uh, last year or some. I think you'll be using that even more this season as well. We saw it primarily against lefties. And I think the curveball is just a, a natural evolution for that as well. That's the thing about Strider, though, is, I mean, with his work ethic and, uh, you know, his the, the, the tension of de detail that he uh, – you know he he puts into all this. Mm -hmm. It's it won't be shocking at all to see him break out another another weapon. You know or be able to come up with another weapon to fa uh, face against, especially against left-handed hitters. And it shouldn't surprise anybody that he's out there looking for that weapon. And I went to Savant and looked up the pitch usage for Strider in 2023. His changeup was used almost exclusively against lefties, but they batted just 128 against the pitch. So it's not like. It didn't work for him. It did when he needed to use it, wanted to use it. And I asked him about that pitch as well because there was so much talk about third pitch for Spencer Strider. Does that send him to a next level? And we're already talking about the Major League Baseball strikeout leader from a year ago. So he said he's not necessarily trying to force it, trying to throw it more, but identify those best times to throw it when it comes to the changeup. Now he can throw a curveball into the mix here. It seems to be uh, quite a year in the making, quite possibly, for Spencer Strider if he further diversifies that portfolio of pitches that he has. Now, all of this says to me that one of the best strikeout pitchers in the game appears to be evolving, and it's not, to your point, surprising at all given his cerebral nature and definitely a scary concept for opposing hitters, regardless of which box you dig into. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, pitchers, I mean, hitters have to be thinking, you know, this, the last thing this guy needs is another weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, again, I think the the biggest takeaway is just how, you know, Spencer Strider is already one of the best pitchers in the National League. And he's not, uh, you know, he's not comfortable with uh, with that success. Uh, you know, he's looking for ways to get better. And I think that's the biggest uh, the biggest takeaway from him uh, as an individual. Yeah, and certainly we're expecting big things from Spencer Strider. More on that in just a little while. But elsewhere in Braves camp, another big story, Tyler Matzik returned to the mound this week, and that is quite simply a wonderful thing. For the first time since early October 2022, Matzik faced an opposing lineup. He tossed a scoreless inning on Monday, and Matzik, he's on that long road back following Tommy John surgery, 16 months now and change at this point. He said he hopes to show the team everything they need to see to be on that opening day roster to be ready to go. But Matzik also noted there's a possibility they could opt to give him some extra innings and a little bit of extra work to be completely ready for his return to the big league. So that might include 
what would amount to a rehab assignment of sorts to start the year. We'll see how that all plays out over the next few weeks. But regardless of the timing, this is a big storyline, Chris, because of what it can mean to this team and to this bullpen to have a healthy Tyler Matzik back in the mix. No doubt. I mean, if he's anywhere close to that form that he showed in 2021, that's a huge weapon that you're adding to the bullpen. It was great just to see him out there. Really didn't care too much about the numbers, you know, just to see him get through that outing and, and um, you know, look healthy doing so. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I know he mentioned the injured, uh, you know, the injury list as a, as a possibility to start the season. But I think the fact that he got out on the mound this early in the spring, I think that that, um, you know, as long as he got through it healthy and, and, and was feeling good, I think that's a good sign that he might be ready for opening day. Yeah, in the second half of last year, we saw Tyler Matzik out doing long toss in the outfield at Truist Park. And then Brian Snitker talked about just how competitive this guy is and the fact that even though he did not throw a pitch at the big league level last year, he wanted to do his work around the team and that rehab process and spend as much time with the guys as possible. I think everyone would love to see Matzik back to 100% and getting the chance to do the kinds of things he did in 2021. Now let's talk a little bit about the lineup, which even for the Braves might have a couple of moving parts here and there. We know who's leading off. We feel pretty good about who three, four, and five is going to be. But two men that I'm looking at to help optimize maybe a couple of spots in this order, Ozzy Albies and Michael Harris II. Ozzy batted second quite a bit over the course of his career and last year. He's also right at home in the middle of the order because he's got some run-producing ability himself. Harris, meanwhile, has been working primarily out of the nine spot in the lineup, though he does move up at times when the Braves need him to. That arrangement, that ninth spot, has worked out very well for Harris and for the Braves, but I think it may be time, Chris, for him to get some more plate appearances from the bottom of the order. It just doesn't offer enough for him, even if he is kind of a catalyst down there at times for a lot of great things the Braves have done. You just want to see more of this guy at this point. Last year, he batted 301 against lefties, so there's no extreme platoon split to deal with with Harris. He plays every day. Albies, meanwhile, OPS well over 1,000 against lefties in 2023, which keeps up the trend from his t- entire career when it comes to wearing out southpaws. I lay all of that out to present Albies batting second against lefties as a switch hitter seems like a strong choice for Brian Snitger and company. But could we finally see Harris get those at-bats in the second spot against righties and allow Albies to do what he's done for so many years and slot into the middle of the lineup, perhaps right behind Marcelo Zuna in the five spot? I, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, dynamic to explore. I'd love, I'd love to see it some as we get to the latter stages of, uh, of spring training. I do think this is the year that Michael Harris moves up in the order. Yeah. You know, you can hit Jerry Kelnick and, and Orlando Arcia, some combination down in eight, nine spot. You know, I think Harris is going to slot in, you know, somewhere around sixth or seventh. But I, I am very intrigued uh, to see him in the second spot against righties. And then obviously, you know, Ozzy's success against lefties makes him a, a perfect uh, perfect per, uh, person to have in that two-hole against southpaw. So uh, very interesting about it. But, I mean, I agree with you. You, you know, slotting uh, Harris in behind my, uh, Ronald Acuna, I think it, I think it would inter- introduce an interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the same dynamics you get from Ozzy Albies being up there when it comes to a bit of a speed factor and you know the, the kind of thing that can be a distraction to pitchers while they're trying to deal with the next couple of guys in the order. So just to clarify in my theory here, it would be Ron Lacuna Jr. leading off, which is that's an example if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Harris batting ninth, not as much. But you lead off with Ronald, you hit Harris or Albies second, Austin Riley, Matt Olson, Marcelo Zuna, and then Harris or Albies batting six behind Ozuna. That, I think, could be a pretty winning combination. You've got your catchers, and as you mentioned, Orlando Arcia and Jared Kelnick, they're kind of wild cards a bit in this lineup. Arcia certainly held his own last year, had some big moments, and we all know what you're hoping to see from Jared Kelnick is that breakout season in 2023, not to spin that record another time here on BPTV. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I mean, there's a lot of depth in this lineup, a lot of uh, a lot of options you can you can go to, and you know, not for, don't forget. I mean, we saw Sean Murphy up in the cleanup spot at times too. Yep. So you know, if he's going good, you know, he could he could even slide up um, slide up in the order, and then you know, at that point, you know, it's just this it's the absurdity of how deep this uh, Braves lineup is. I mean, you just got so many options. Yeah, absurdity is a very good word. Now, before we wrap up this episode of the show, I want to play a game a little over under, and I want to do so for the starting rotation. And we may play this a time or two more before spring training is over, but please note, these are just my numbers and purely for entertainment purposes. I'm not suggesting that any money be laid out on any of these, but I thought it'd be fun to play a little game. And obviously there are going to be some more important numbers as relates to each one of these guys. But I think that if we find them going over on these particular categories, 
then a lot of good stuff is probably happening in that Braves rotation. Let's start with Spencer Strider. Chris, I am going at over on 299.5 strikeouts. So 299 and a half strikeouts. Are you over or are you under on Spencer Strider? I'm over. This is 300 strikeout season for Spencer Strider. I think he's going to put it all together. I think he's going to win the Cy Young. So that's how uh, that's how how much uh, I'm putting behind him. Pretty straightforward. 281 strikeouts led Major League Baseball last year, and he did all of that really still kind of searching for maybe one more piece of his arsenal, one more weapon. As Chris talked about earlier, is a curveball. That weapon, is that the X factor for Spencer Strider? Either way, we're both over on 299 and a half strikeouts. Chris Sale, over under 139 and a half innings pitched, Chris. Mm. I'm going to go over just because of how he is, has uh, presented himself this spring. He looked great in his debut. Uh, he looks healthy. I think a lot of people are expecting the Braves to really manage his innings, but I think you're going to have to hit this guy over the head to keep him from going out there. You know, at this point, I think he, he's got something to prove. I think he wants to prove he's healthy. He's still a, a top flight pitcher. So I'm going to go over, even though I know the risks associated with that. Yeah, I'm also going to go over, and I really kind of languished over this decision because I don't want to suggest that he's going to miss a lot of time, but I also am not going to sit here and suggest to you with a straight face that he's going to throw 180, 190 or more innings this year. I don't think that's going to be the case, unless maybe you add what he does in the postseason. If all things go according to plan for the Braves, that could definitely happen. But I was looking right around that 140 innings mark as a really good mile marker for Chris Sale. He threw just over 100 for Boston last year, making 20 starts. If he makes 27, 28, or 30 starts for the Braves this year at an average of about five innings per start, a little bit more, a little bit less, that's 150 innings, I think, is what the Braves would be very comfortable with out of Chris Sale. They just want him pitching every fifth day, so we'll see how all that plays out. Max Freed, this is going to be on wins. Everybody's favorite pitcher statistic, Chris, over under 14 and a half wins for Max Freed. Uh, over easily as long as the, and I think the only question for that is, is it, it, will he stay healthy enough? And I mean, I know a lot of, you know, he had a tough 2023 season in terms of injuries, but he's logged a lot of starts, a lot of innings, uh, over the last few seasons with the Braves. I think as long as he's healthy with the Braves offense and his ability as a pitcher, he'll, he'll easily clear that, um, clear that mark. I know Max got sick in 2022 at the very end of the season, and that clearly cost him in the postseason. But I see 2023 as the outlier when it comes to injury. Like you just said, I mean, he'd been very dependable over the prior four, if not five full seasons. You throw in the shortened season. He did everything he could that year as well. And the Braves have been able to count on him in their rotation, really, since 2019 with no extended absence until his stint on the injured list last year. So I'm going to go over 14 and a half wins. I'd love to see Max Fried become the third Brave in as many years to win 20 games. And with this offense, if Freed's healthy, I think 20 wins is definitely on the table for him. Charlie Morton, this is the elder statesman of the staff. He's 40 years old now, Chris. Over under 29 and a half starts for Charlie Morton. I'm going to go under on this one, and not because I think he's going to get hurt. I just think it's there's going to it's going to be a situation where the Braves are really going to try to uh, limit uh, his opportunities. Perhaps I think he had 28 starts last year, if I'm not mm-hmm. not mistaken, somewhere close to that. I think they want him healthy for the postseason. Obviously, you know what happened to him last year was a freak thing. Yeah. Uh, but I do think this will be one of those situations where they just try to give him an extra day here or there, and maybe hold him back just a little bit. I'm also going to go under, but not because I'm expecting there to be some lengthy absence, but just because I feel like the Braves really like their depth that they have at starting pitcher even more this year than a season ago. And I know it evaporated very quickly for the Braves a year ago, but still, you have some options this year that simply weren't on the table. Ronaldo Lopez, for example, Bryce Elder being who he is, and we'll get to both those guys in just a minute, could help out in that fifth spot. And then you've got some other younger arms who could also be factors in there that have some big league experience in the case of A.J. smith Shaver or a big-time pedigree in the case of Hurston Waldrop. And that's not to mention all of the different names, including a couple coming back from injury in eventually, hopefully, Ian Anderson by midsummer, mid to late summer, and Waskari Noah. So we'll see how all of that plays out. That, I think, factors into my calculus for how many starts even Sale or Charlie Morton have to make because the Braves, they don't have to feel like they have to push them. And the offense is a big reason why. All right, Reynaldo Lopez, over under 19 and a half starts for one of the newest members of the Atlanta Braves. I'm going to go under. I think um, I think he will get a chance to start early. 
Uh, but as you mentioned, the, the amount of depth that they have uh, for that fifth starter spot, and I just think this guy is going to be a difference maker out of the bullpen once they finally do decide to move him into that role. Two inning, three, uh, you know, a two inning guy. If he stretched out, even a three inning guy, I think he's going to be a, a huge weapon in the postseason in that capacity. And at, at some point, they'll they'll slot him into that role full time. Yeah, I'm going to go under, but this I really felt like I may have put myself in a weird place with like the break even point of what I feel like is a reasonable expectation when you factor in all of the other context around who could be starting for the Braves. But Reynaldo Lopez, if he proves it. I wouldn't be shocked to see him go over 19 and a half starts, but I'm going to say under for right now. Let's go to Bryce Elder. This is another one of people's favorite pitcher stats. 3.50 ERA over under for Bryce Elder. I'm going to go over. Um, you know, he had a great season last year, the first half, but he kind of uh, outperformed his metrics. A little bit of regression in the second half. I still think he can throw some quality innings for this team, uh, but I think his, you know, his true talent level is probably going to come in just a little bit above that uh, 3.5 uh, number. Yeah, I'm going to go over, even if it's just slightly. I do feel like over the course of a long season, and you look across baseball, I mean, you'll take a three and a half ERA every fifth day out of your rotation in just about every spot. Sure, there's going to be some guys who are way better. There are going to be some guys that are not even close to that, and they're just trying to keep you in the game and let the bullpen do the rest. But I feel like Bryce, I mean, he's I'm not going to say he's got chip on his shoulder because if you've talked to him, he doesn't really sound like that guy. But I do feel like he comes into spring training feeling like he does have something to prove for this club. So we'll see what that experience from a year ago helps him to prove to the Braves here in 2024. And we'll obviously see how this whole thing plays out over the course of the season, the changes to the Atlanta rotation. They started early and often in 2023 because of injury issues. Chris, how this season will go and how many of those changes the Braves are going to have to make. Some of the names that we mentioned, some that we haven't. We're all going to find out together, aren't we? Yeah, without a doubt. I think you know the biggest thing right now is just watching these guys in the spring, hoping that they can get through, uh, get through this month and get to opening day without you know without any setbacks or anything. But as you, I'm excited, I'm excited about this rotation much more so than I was at the at the end of last season. So I'm I'm anxious to see how it plays out. Yeah, as always, hit that subscribe button right here on the Battery Power Channel and turn on those notifications. You'll get an alert every time we drop a new episode. But this is the end of the road for us on this particular episode. For Chris Willis, I'm Grant McCauley. Thanks again for riding along with us, and we will catch you next time. And until then, so long, Braves country. <laughs>